Well, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. And we now begin our webinar on Brexit. And you're very, very warmly welcomed to this um, interactive hour or so together. Already your instructions should be up on the screen in terms of how you ask a question. As you'll see there that um, we will be having three presentations. I'll come to that in, in a second. And just to let you know that this webinar is being recorded. So if you, if you can keep your questions reasonably polite, I think that would be a good idea for all of you and me. Um, my name is Gary Streeter. I'm the member of Parliament for Southwest Devon, and it's my great pleasure to host this seminar. Um, next slide, please, Olivia. You see there that um, our, we have three main speakers. In a moment, I'll introduce Stuart Elford, who's the Chief Executive of Plymouth and Devon Chambers of Commerce, who will introduce our main speaker, Surin Tiru, who's going to talk to us about Brexit preparedness. And then we have two presentations from our hardworking trading standards officers about some of the detail of preparing for Brexit. And then there'll be hopefully plenty of time for questions and answers uh, and you'll you'll present them through the chat system. Um, let's not get too technical. If there are detailed questions that you need to raise with uh, our speakers, we possibly can take that offline. So let's try and make sure that the questions are of general applicability, not, not just to your own business. Um, next slide, please. Just for me to say a, a huge thank you to all of those who are supporting today's webinar, Devon, Devon, Plymouth and Plymouth Chamber of Commerce have been a very hardworking, very faithful partner with all of us over the last interesting nine or 10 months. Southwest Tourism Alliance, the Institute of Directors, the Federation of Small Businesses, um, visit Devon, and uh, that's all I can see on the screen. Anyone I've forgotten, the NFU, they've been terrific, the IOD and so on. So thank you to all of you who've been supporting us uh, supporting these series of webinars throughout the last 12 months, trying to get people ready for this most important event that's about to happen. Uh, just a few words from me, if I may. Um, there's quite a lot to say, of course. I won't go into the, the background about Brexit. One or two of our speakers might do that. But it's certainly been my view since we left the EU on the 31st of January. It's been my confident expectation that we would do a, a free trade agreement or a, a new trade deal with the EU, but probably at five to midnight. That always seems to be the way. Well, we're, I guess we're at about quarter to midnight now. And as you probably know, um, it's it would be very hard to predict that a deal is now going to be done. And I think the PM said yesterday, more likely than not, that we'll have no deal. Now, the focus of this seminar is to talk about the changes that are coming up anyway on the 1st of January, whether we have a deal or whether we don't. Uh, and that's, I think, is, is it of enormous value. But I'm sure all of you out there have been given a lot of thought to what impact on your business there would be on of the 1st of January, of leaving anyway, but certainly of a no deal Brexit. And, and no doubt one or two of those questions will come up. If I had to put money on it, I would say we probably won't get a deal. But that between Easter and Christmas, yes, there'd be a bump in the road. And then something, uh, some kind of resolution would be arrived at between both sides. So even if we go into our new relationship with the EU on, in January without a deal, my, my strong feeling is that that won't last long, that season won't last long, and something more positive will come out of that. So there we are. So first of all, then, it's a, it's a delight for me to introduce Stuart Alford, who I've known for many, many years. Stuart is the Chief Executive of the Plymouth and Devon Chamber, uh, and he's just going to introduce our main speaker. Stuart, over to you. Thank you, Scary, and thank you so much for joining us on this event. Um, thank you to all, in fact, for joining us. It's a very, very important time and a very, very important issue, of course. Um, I will shortly introduce Sir Anthony, who's um, Head of Economics at British Chambers of Commerce, but I just wanted to uh, briefly update you on uh, the Chamber itself and what we've been doing. As Sir Gary said, I'm really delighted to partner with the uh, other organisations uh, you saw there listed at the start of this uh, presentation. Uh, and particularly thanks to Sir Gary for uh, listening to the concerns of business as chair of the All Party Parliamentary Group of the Southwest. Uh, Sir Gary and I have a great relationship. I'm, I'm very 
grateful that he allows me to just pick up the phone and, and bend his ear when there are business issues. So thank you uh, so much for that. Um, we are in a very tricky time. British Chambers of Commerce produced a rag rated um, document with 35 unanswered questions of business. Uh, what does business need to know to be able to operate effectively at the end of the transition period? And as it stands, 24 of those are still uh, color coded as amber or red, meaning there are still questions outstanding. And uh, British Chambers of Commerce working very hard with uh, Bayes and with the Department for International Trade to get answers to those questions and to provide you the clarity you need to be able to um, operate effectively. And I, I laugh because I think uh, we need more clarity is second only to uh, you're on mute as the most common phrase of 2020. Um, so uh, I, I think what's clear is that um, uh, Brexit is more than about just import and export. It's more than about trade tariffs, although those are, those are of course, incredibly important. Um, uh, and this seminar will, will address some of those issues. There's issues over data, over immigration, over food labeling, over uh, all sorts of things. And um, you're all, of course, doing absolutely the right thing and trying to get as appraised as you can now uh, by joining us. British Chambers of Commerce, um, the accredited Chamber of Commerce Network is here to support you. Uh, for those who don't know, Chambers of Commerce are membership organizations. We have no um, central funding. We are not uh, in any way affiliated to uh, government or any political party. Uh, we are totally independent, funded through membership. We provide international trade services, that's import, export, documentation, advice and training. We provide business supportive advice. Uh, we obviously run events such as this and when we can in person. Uh, but one of the things we do, which is um, prior to the pandemic, I would say, is more behind the scenes, is our policy advocacy lobbying work. Um, but that's come to the fore uh, more than ever. And we're delighted to have been able to assist our partners in local authorities to support uh, businesses on the ground to ensure they've got the grants, the, the advice, the information they need to get through this challenging time. We're nearly there. So hang on in there. Uh, I know we've got the double uh, whammy of um, COVID and now Brexit, but you're doing the right thing. We're here together. Um, uh, your chamber, your family is here to support you. Uh, and so uh, thank you very much for that. And we will look after you as best we can and provide the advice we can. Anyway, you didn't join to hear me waffle on. What you uh, joined to hear is from our keynote speaker, uh, Siren Thru, who's the uh, head of economics at British Chambers uh, of Commerce. Um, and uh, he is um, absolutely um, got his finger on the pulse of what is going on here uh, and uh, he's smiling because that's no putting no pressure on him but he 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 will I, I am sure you will be both fascinated entertained and interested and and really glad that you join to hear what Seren has to say so without any further ado uh, I will hand over to him thank you very much Thanks, thanks, Stuart. It's a good morning, everyone. And thanks particularly, Stuart, for the very uh, kind introduction. Um, so I'm just going to spend the next sort of 10 to 15 minutes to um, get a bit of an introduction to what we may be discussing a bit later. Um, we're going to talk uh, specifically around uh, Brexit preparedness. And so what we're going to do is present some research we've done on this over the last couple of months. And um, so that's going to form the main basis of this talk. I'm also going to offer a few thoughts following from what Gary said around sort of the, break, the uh, trade negotiations and what we see um, from here in Westminster. Um, and then also look at potential options again for preparing uh, for what may happen come the 1st of January. So just before I go into the main body of the, of the, of the talk, I just, if Oliver, if you move to the next slide, I just want to give you a bit of background about the BCC itself. So as Stuart mentioned, um, we're part, uh, the, the BCC is a network of 53 accredited chambers across the UK of which Devon and Plymouth Chamber is one of our best, I must say, Stuart. Um, it employs around 6 million people. Um, the type of businesses we represent are all shapes and sizes, from one-man bands up to large corporates across all sectors. Um, but the main one for our business, our members are within the sort of SME space. Um, and as Stuart mentioned, we're very much in the, in the international trade business. That makes us quite unique compared to some of the other business groups out there. And clearly it means that we're very uniquely placed, particularly with our global network, um, to be a, a, key, a clear voice, not only in the negotiations we're seeing at the moment, but as we move forward into a post-Brexit uh, period, which is going to be really crucial going forward. 
So if, if you can move to the next slide, I'll just start talking about some of the research we've carried out. So we've been doing having quite a close look about what's been going on across the country around preparing for Brexit. Um, so we've been asking businesses a range of questions about how, what steps they've been taking to prepare for whatever comes next. And now this slide shows a, a question we've been asking for a number of years now about whether a business has done a risk assessment around the potential impact of the end of the transition period on their business. And as you can see from the, from the figures that we've received, is that it's, it's quite a certainly low number of businesses have actually done a risk assessment around the potential impact of, of the end of the transition period. Just 38% of businesses have done that in total. Now you see that number of flexes compared to, uh, depending on what on the type of business. So what I'm illustrating this chart is looking at those internationally active businesses. We've done a lot more preparation, over half businesses have done preparation, uh, and it falls to less than one in five for those who, who are UK only focused. Um, and this goes to the heart of a point that we're gonna really emphasize during this seminar in that, of course, there are a lot of businesses that are actively engaged in the national trading process, and a lot of them are engaged in preparing for Brexit um, or the end of the transition period but there's still a large number of businesses who, who don't see themselves as being necessarily exposed to some of the headwinds that may come and some of the changes that may come from the end of the transition period. And that could be businesses that are part of global supply chains. So maybe you can, you can only focus, but their, their end massive customer may be exposed to the, to the EU, for example. Um, and may import or, or uh, from the EU as well. And again, so that's really important focus from this research. What we're also seeing in our data is a split between business size. So large businesses are doing a lot more preparation than smaller businesses, um, and that's quite clear. We're also seeing a regional split as well. So we're seeing businesses in Northern Ireland, for example, doing a lot more preparation, um, which is unsurprising in some ways, given some of the challenges around the border between Northern Ireland, uh, GB and Republic of Ireland, and obviously the rest of the single market. If moving to the next slide, Livia. And this gives a bit of historical context to the question we've asked. Um, so as I mentioned, this year we've asked the question and 38% of businesses have done risk assessment. Compared to this to last year and 2019, where we saw 57% of businesses who had done a risk assessment. So it's been quite a significant drop off this year compared to last year in terms of Brexit preparations. And again, I talked a little bit in terms of reasons why we think this has happened. But that's really concerning given that we are very much at the end point now, given the transition period is ending in a few weeks. That's clearly concern. And as you can see, we're pretty much back to where we were in 2018, where around 35% of businesses had done some form of risk assessment about the impact of Brexit in their transition period on their business. So clearly that has concern in terms of that's not the direction of travel we, we should be seeing. Now again, historically, we are seeing the same splits. Internationally active businesses are doing more preparations than those who are UK only focused. And large businesses are doing more preparations than those at the smaller end as well. Um, if you move to the next slide. So this goes into a bit more detail in terms of what types of preparations businesses are taking um, are, are, are doing at the moment. So back in July, uh, Michael Gove uh, wrote to businesses outlining eight steps that businesses should be taking to prepare for changes or in moving goods between UK and EU. So this includes things like registering for an, for an EORI number or looking at some of the government guidance. And as you can see, overall, for pretty much all the measures that I've outlined there, um, businesses have not really taken the steps that they need to take. That's quite a, a clear concern. And the figure I want to highlight is right at the bottom. We look at none of these. And 51% and of businesses have done none of these eight steps to prepare for the end of the transition period. But again, it's clearly concerning. because These are numbers of specific and, and, and good steps that need to be taken, no matter whether we get a deal or not. That's clearly concerning. Again, we are seeing that split between internationally active businesses and UK-only businesses, and that you know, see, you know, eighty-six percent of businesses have done of UK-only focused businesses, and none of these compared to um, less than a, just over a quarter for internationally active businesses. So again, there is that split between those who are, are used to trading, exporting, and those who are just UK-only focused who have not necessarily done the preparation that may need to do. Can we move on to the next slide? So what are some reasons for this? Well, I think there's two main reasons for this. Now we can't um, distinguish between the impacts of COVID and preparation levels. because I think there is as a clear link we're seeing this year. And one of the reasons why we have seen that rollback compared to what we saw in 2019, 
kind of in terms of preparation levels. Now, of course, the businesses across the UK, um, the impact of COVID on, on, on their business has been significant, particularly for those in some sectors like hospitality. And one of the key crunch points for a lot of businesses has been cash flow. And we see this from this chart, or we, this is from our quarterly economic survey. And what we see is that cash flow from the manufacturing services sector is still at a really low level, and that more, this chart shows that more firms are still seeing a decline in cash flow than, than are seeing an increase. And our own data also shows that one in three businesses are seeing that they have three months worth or less of cash in reserve um, compared to where they were a, a couple of months ago and even this time last year. That's clearly a concern. You see from that chart, a lot of businesses are in a pretty weak position in terms of cash flow. So that's had, an, in our views, that's had a real impact on breast preparedness that you've seen a lot of businesses roll back some of the, prepare, some of the preparations compared to last year. For example, some businesses would have stockpiled over the last year, particularly in the manufacturing sector. We've heard sort of, I guess, anecdotal evidence that that's sort of, uh, that's been rolled back. And that's because a lot of the cost pressures that have been caused by, by COVID um, has an impact on that in particular. So that's one reason. The second reason, which Stuart alluded to earlier, if you move to the next slide, is around gaps in government guidance. This is a really key area that we're really concerned about. Because um, obviously we're talking about preparation, preparing for, uh, for Brexit. But in many ways, preparing for Brexit at the moment is a bit like trying to hit a moving target. There's lots of pieces that haven't been decided on. There's lots of changes that still haven't been determined. There's lots of fluidity about some of the key areas. And what we found, as, as Stuart mentioned, is that in our own research is that the number of key areas where there's still major gaps in government guidance. And uh, this chart shows, as, as Stuart mentioned, only 11 areas have got sort of green, green rag rating ideas, sufficient information for businesses to make, take an action. Now the feedback we have in government on this is that they have tried a lot of information on a number of these areas, which is true, they have, but much of it isn't actionable business guidance. And that's where a lot of the information that businesses, that government has been providing in government UK is falling down, is that much of the guidance isn't actionable for businesses. This includes areas like tariff rate quotas, things around rules of origin, issues around data, issues around BAT, um, that, and issues around some of the stuff that we're going to talk about a bit later as well. Um, so that's clearly a concern because if you haven't seen businesses seeing, having cash flow issues, you also seen businesses not getting the information they need. What we're now in a situation that a lot of businesses are feeling a lot of Brexit fatigue, as I'm sure most of you, you are and general public are, given we're, we're four years down the line. I think that's having an impact as well on what we're seeing um, in terms of Brexit, Brexit preparedness. So we are in a situa situation where we're seeing a lot of businesses who are not prepared as, as they should be for the end of the transition period. Some of it is obviously the government's fault and la the lack of clear information. Another part of it is the fact that we haven't got a uh, clear idea of what sort of trade deal we're going to have going forward, which means some of the information that businesses need is still contingent on that. But also, thirdly, we also see the impact of Brexit causing businesses to roll back to some of their preparations and, and not having necessarily the bandwidth um, to, to make the preparations through this year, because of course, COVID has had a big impact on businesses right across the economy. If you move to the next slide. Um, this is a few examples of some of the this quality of the feedback we've had from our research about some of the, if, some of the guidance, some of the gaps in guidance that businesses have been highlight, highlighting. And as you can see, there's quite a few, wide range of, of concerns and issues. For example, right at the start bottom, what's reinforced the point I mentioned is that a lot of businesses are finding the government UK website quite confusing. Any of you have gone on there and used their search tool for information that you may need. If you type in your criteria, you type business that you operate, you know, whether you export to EU, whether you employ people from the EU, et cetera, what you tend to get back is a library of information rather than specific action points and specific information that you actually need to do your, to prepare for the end of the transition period. So this is again, as Stuart mentioned earlier, it's a point we're really pushing quite closely and we need to get actionable information. Again, other areas of concern, you can see there's issues around sort of arrangement collecting on duties, VAT as I mentioned, um, whether businesses need an Irish EURI number if they're selling into the Republic of Ireland, issues around the cost of export document declarations as well. So huge wide range of areas. And this is again, clearly concerning now we've only just over 20, 20 odd days up to, 
until the end of the transition period. That again is clearly concerning and is a you know, key reason why we're seeing some of these challenges around Brexit preparedness. Move on to the next slide. So that's our research. Um, and just a bit of a view in terms of where we are, where, where BCC sees um, what is going on at the moment. Now, clearly, as Gary mentioned at the start, there's clearly large gaps in between where the UK and the EU are regarding a future trade deal. I think some of what's being talked about over the last couple of days, even yesterday when the Prime Minister talked about um, that businesses should prepare for no deal, I think some of that is, is around choreography, around the political sort of things that happen around these types of deals. Um, and that's on both, both the UK and the EU side. But in many ways, um, from our point of view, we shouldn't really be surprised where we are at the moment because any, many of you who've, who've done sort of business deals and we see with many trade deals with the EU, they do go to the last minute. And so we shouldn't really be surprised where we are at the moment. And of course, for both sides, what's the trade deal is, is, is dealing with lots of un relatively unique issues. For example, the UK hasn't negotiated a trade deal for, of this scale anyway for, for over 40 years. On the EU side, they haven't really negotiated a trade deal which involves increasing barriers, one decreasing barriers, which again is a challenge for them. I think it's also a challenge with the size of the country and also the location as well, um, because the vast majority of the EU trade, the trade deals the EU have been negotiating in the past have either been with smaller countries uh, compared, to the, uh, compared to the UK or with countries that are quite far away. So that the gravitational, gravitational pull, which makes UK much more in line to much more stronger beneficiary of, of, of having a trade deal with the EU. Now there has been talk um, over the last couple of days following the uh, dinner between uh, um, uh, with Boris Johnson in, in the midweek that there's a Sunday deadline around um, where, around which um, Brexit negotiations would come to hold either way. Um, we think that's probably a false deadline in some ways in the sense that um, I think there, this is again sort of political, uh, some political games around it, because actually there was only one firm deadline and that's the 31st of December. So while there's a lot of talk today around the Sunday deadline, we think that again, it, you know, there's probably some flexibility around that. Um, there are significant areas of dispute that still remain. Um, fisheries, of course, there's a lot, been, a lot of coverage around that. Um, the biggest ones probably around sort of the thing around level playing fields. And there's not necessarily the dispute that needs to be level playing field between the EU and the UK, but actually what might happen, what might happen in the future if the, if the UK or indeed the EU wants to change some standards around environments, around uh, job uh, workers' rights, et cetera, what happens there? That's sort of the real sticking point in the moment. Um, our view at the moment is that the deal is possibly still more, slightly more um, likely than no deal, um, but that's, but that's that, that's sort of probably decreased over the past week in particular. Uh, but we think it'd be very a uh, very late deal. We also think it'd be a very thin deal compared to maybe what we what many would have hoped uh, at the start of these negotiations. Um, moving away from the sort of uh, UK EU deal, uh, it's right to sort of I guess say that a lot of progress has been made. So the UK has signed continuity agreements uh, covering fifty seven countries. So these are rolling essentially rolling over those agreements where you, you can have access by the EU deal. Um, so UK has negotiated around 57 uh, uh, deals covering 57 countries, which is quite significant and no small achievement. So the government should be applauded for that because it covers around sort of 200 billion worth of trade. And some of those agreements, particularly with Canada, for example, does lay, lay the framework for a more comprehensive trade deal um, going forward, which is clearly beneficial for the UK. We heard earlier this week uh, that the EU and UK Joint Committee um, have agreed in principle uh, uh, an agreement around Northern Ireland Protocol, which will again help a lot of businesses who, who trade between GB and uh, NNI. Uh, but again, we need to see the detail on that to make, uh, make a firm view on that. Um, but again, the point I want to emphasize really through this talk is that whether there's a deal or not, and again, we may know that very late in the day, it's imperative that businesses who haven't stopped preparing do start preparing because a lot of the challenges that may arise around a deal or no deal will be the same in, in, in many respects around customers, thinking around moving things across borders. So it's important that you prepare in either case for either scenario, and that's really important. So if you move to the next slide. Um, so this is, again, given that there are, given that there are all those uncertainties that I mentioned, 
there are still things that you can do. So we've come a list up with this sort of 10 steps, which we think um, you can take. I won't go through all of them, just highlight a few of them. Of course, Stuart mentioned absolutely speak to your local chamber of commerce. Um, they're experts in national trade and, and all things around customs. So they can help you help you make sort of key decisions, give you key advice. There's also things you can do as a business as well. Have you sort of looked at your own business? Have you done some sort of, sort of Brexit proofing? So have you checked your, checked your supply chains? Have you checked, have you mapped your customer base? Have you considered how changes to the UK EU relationship may impact your business? Some of those things you don't know, but things like looking at where you're where your suppliers are, where your customers are, and how that may impact your business if there is a no deal. I think that's something you can do. Can, have you checked whether you can access some of the some of the easements, some of the measures that have been, been put in place to try and smooth that transition, such as registering for an EOE number, um, checking if custom guarantees, simplified procedures uh, will be helpful to your business. Again, these are steps you can take now and are really important to take in lieu of whether there is a deal or not. So, you know, while I said, while there is sort of uncertainties of what might happen, there's still, there's still real practical steps that you, that you should be taking if you haven't done already to prepare for what may happen at the start of next year. And just a round off, we move, that, move to the next slide. And just to highlight, we, we've and just sort of flagged a couple of resources that you may find useful, which, which again, I think these links we've, we circulate at the end of the, and the webinar. The BCC have created a end of, end of transition uh, period checklist, which is based on some research we've done and, and some of the, uh, uh, the discussions we've had with businesses right across the country and also with governments as well about what you need to be looking at to prepare for the end of the transition period. So it's basically a list of things that you need to go through, you know, at a board level, um, you know, with financial directors, with your suppliers, with customers. Um, again, it's, we think we think it's important. Again, we think it's an important resource to to highlight the questions you need to be looking at. Also, some of the research resource points as well in terms of what you may be looking at going forward. You know, to help with help going forward. Again, what we also again emphasise: speak to your local chamber of commerce because they can help you address some of these really key issues. And lastly, um, another resource to flag, uh, Chain Customs, which is, a, which is a customs advisory uh, training and brokerage service, which is delivered through Chambers of Commerce across the UK. So it actually is a real opportunity for you to utilize some of the expertise within the chain network to help you. And this is being particularly important if there is a no deal situation where a lot of these sort of research and, and sort of advice uh, would be really important going forward. Um, so in summary, before I hand, hand back to um, Gary, Clearly, there is a lot of uncertainty over what is, what is going to happen over the next couple of weeks. Clearly, COVID has, an, has had an impact on business' ability to, to prepare for the, for the end of the transition period. But the sort of key takeaway from me is that there is a lot you still can do to prepare for what may come next. And with that, thank you for your time, and I'll hand back to Gary. Thank you very much indeed, sir, and fascinating. Thank you. Very, very helpful and very thoughtful. Um, and as I said before, please do put your questions in the chat box if you have them, either for Surin or our two next speakers. Now, he, Surin was our, our um, keynote speaker. We're now going to have two sets of snappy 10-minute presentations from two excellent uh, trading standards officers for Devon, Torbay and Somerset tr Trading Office. First of all, Julie Richardson is going to talk to us about Brexit and food labelling. Julie, over to you. Uh, th thank you. Um, thanks for inviting me to speak at this event. Uh, my name is Julie Richardson. I'm the lead officer for uh, food standards for Devon, Somerset and Torbay trading standards. So just as a brief uh, introduction, uh, uh, trading standards officer with 19 years experience, um, I oversee the delivery of food standards enforcement on behalf of trading standards across our three counties, so Devon, Torbay and Somerset. By no means uh, an expert on food labelling, um, but I do provide advice and support to officers um, basically on what we enforce and how we enforce it in respect of food labelling. If there are questions at the end, uh, I'll do my best to answer them. But as we know, this is a very dynamic situation. So it may be that I have to defer answering straight away, but I will try to give a response where I can. Uh, so uh, begin my presentation by talking about uh, changes that will apply to general food labeling. Uh, thank you, Olivia. <laughs> 
um, when we leave the EU at the end of the transition period. Uh, there's no doubt that uh, changes will need to be made to food labels. That's pretty logical uh, and straightforward. Uh, once we officially leave the EU, you know, any labels uh, on food products, they won't be able to make reference to being made in the EU. Uh, they won't be able to display the EU flags, logos, emblems. It's fairly straightforward. Country of origin uh, will need to refer to UK or GB. So, so any references to the EU or the European communities will need to be removed. Um, there's also a whole raft of product specific rules uh, that apply to foods like meat, fruit and vegetables, olive oil, honey, beef and veal, eggs and so on. Um, I won't be going into the finer detail of these specific requirements. But as a general rule, where the current rules require us to refer to UK produce as EU, this will obviously have to change to non-EU. So an example of this you can see on screen at the moment, uh, it's a honey label. Uh, so previously, uh, current time, uh, UK honey falls under EU, so therefore it says, uh, you know, EU honeys. Uh, as of uh, 1st of January next year, uh, we will change to non-EU. Uh, and I think that's fairly straightforward, self-explanatory, and, and shouldn't really come as any surprise to anyone. Um, now, I don't think anyone will really take issue with these changes, but what we really need to know is when do we actually have to implement these changes? In practice, what do we have to do? But there are clearly financial implications to altering food labels. You know, unless you're fortunate enough to have the equipment uh, and facilities to produce labels on demand in-house, uh, you know, you'll need to have them, uh, uh, you know, re re reproduced. Uh, you probably have stocks of labels um, that you've already uh, paid for uh, and have been prepared well in advance. You know, content has to be approved and sent over to uh, label manufacturers uh, you know, sometimes months in advance of production. So uh, at what point, you know, do you have to bite the bullet and, and change the actual label that goes on to the product? I think that's what we all really want to know. Um, so the indications, it's fair to say really that the government, you know, fully recognises the impact of making these changes. Uh, the indications are uh, that businesses who trade only in the UK uh, on the domestic market uh, will have a discretionary period in which to continue selling products and using up these old stocks. Uh, period is set to end on the 30th of September uh, 2022. So essentially that gives us uh, some breathing space to be able to start making changes. Uh, but uh, I must point out this only applies to products being sold on the domestic market here in the UK. So if you trade in Europe, uh, then really time scales and technical details are very much dependent on the outcomes of the talks that are taking place in Europe at the moment. Uh, as it stands, uh, it's entirely possible that we leave the EU without a trade deal. Now, if that happens, uh, and obviously it's looking increasingly likely that that will happen, then we will, uh, food businesses will need to comply with the new rules from the 1st of January, 2021. We don't yet know if the EU will allow us any discretionary period in return, uh, but uh, businesses need to be prepared that if we do leave without a deal, the food that is placed on the market after the 1st of January, 2021, will need to be fully compliant with EU rules. So, <clears throat> this begs the question, uh, what does that actually mean when food is placed on the market? And uh, there's a great deal of guidance on the Europa website, which you may have already seen, uh, which explains when placing on the market actually takes place. Now, if you have any doubt really about how this applies to your own specific situations, uh, there's numerous uh, example scenarios that are available on this website to actually help you understand uh, if your own product uh, has been placed on the market as of uh, 1st of January, 2021. Uh, essentially what it means is, in summary really, uh, if you've sold the product, uh, 
then it's you know it's placed on the market so physical transfer doesn't actually have to have taken place it, it could be sat in a warehouse in the uk uh, it could be in a holding premise in europe awaiting on with transit but uh if it's placed on the market is expected that manufacturer has actually been completed and that there has been an agreed uh, you know an agreement to transfer ownership so the product's been sold so you know as an example if you if you manufacture biscuits uh, and you have a contract to supply uh with a european trading partner uh the goods are deemed to be placed on the market whether or not they've actually been consigned out of the uk so if you have food that uh, has not yet been placed on the market, uh, but it's intended for the EU market, then as of the 1st of January 2021, uh, you will need to make sure that it meets uh, full EU requirements to continue trading in Europe. Uh, next slide, please. So the biggest changes to the food industry undoubtedly will apply if you are trading in Europe. Uh, if you currently trade with countries outside Europe, then you'll be uh, very familiar with the technical rules that apply to importing and exporting food with third countries. So if we leave the EU without a trade deal, uh, we're set to become a third country, which essentially means we lose all our privileges that uh, currently enable us to trade freely with the businesses in European countries. Uh, what does this mean in practice? So uh, now obviously I don't have time here in just a, a short 10 minute slot, to, to go into the detail about technical rules for importing and exporting food. Uh, I know there's a lot of guidance on, online, certainly through the Growth Hub, uh, but in, in a nutshell, you know, it affects who can actually trade uh, and the processes and procedures that we have to comply with to be able to continue trading. Uh, food Standards Agency is, is currently compiling lists of businesses uh, who wish to be included uh, to, on the list of premises that will be authorised to export food to Europe after the deadline. Uh, if you handle food that contains product of animal origin, uh, you'll be familiar with things like health marks. Uh, and you'll see examples of those on the screen. Um, you'll be aware that these will need to be changed to reflect the fact that the UK is no longer part of the European community, uh, and they do that by removing the EC letters. So we'll simply say United Kingdom, GB, UK, uh, are the examples on the screen. So you have to uh, export health certificates uh, where you didn't previously have to. Uh, there'll be additional checks when you bring food in or take food out of the country. Uh, new rules which will affect uh, where you can actually uh, land or, or exit the food from the country. Um, food containing products of animal origins, such as meat, fish, egg products, cheese, milk, uh, they can all continue to be sold if they've been placed on the market uh, before the 1st of January 2021. But if placing on the market takes place after that date, uh, they will need to comply with full EU requirements. Next slide, please. So just a few other things that uh, affect food labelling um, after the deadline. So if you produce organic foods, uh, no doubt you'll have been looking into the, uh, the advice that's available online. Um, but uh, currently uh, we have an EU organic uh, scheme. Uh, and the logo obviously from the 1st of January, 2021, uh, you'll no longer be able to uh, display the EU organic logo on your foods. Um, and obviously there will be restrictions on exporting um, organic food to Europe. So um, new UK logos, you need to have those on your labels from the 1st of January, 2021. Um, there's a list of UK organic control bodies, which includes uh, all of those that are uh, displayed on the screen, examples of the, the current organic control bodies. Uh, and that's really if we, you know, if we leave without a deal, we don't yet know um, whether there will be any sort of equivalency deal. Um, so whether Europe will continue to recognise our own organic produce, uh, if it's certified by one of our UK control bodies. Uh, the fine detail of that unfortunately has not yet been agreed, uh, but uh, you know, watch the .gov website for further information on this particular issue. Uh, next slide, please. 
<clears throat> the other area that will be affected is the um, protected food names scheme. Uh, this only affects producers uh, who produce uh, foods, particular foods that um, are under one of the uh, geographical indication schemes. Uh, you'll be familiar with the three logos that are on the screen, the, the red and yellow, the blue and yellow uh, logos. Um, as of the uh, 1st of January, existing authorizations, they will continue to be recognized. Um, and, and we're basically in the UK launching a new UK protected food name scheme. Uh, and the new logos you can see are the black, white and yellow logos. Uh, they will be applicable to all new applications. Uh, all new applications will uh, have to be made uh, to DEFRA instead of uh, to the EU. Um, and we will, in the UK, continue to recognise existing EU authorisations. So I uh, hope that just gives you a little flavour of the things that will affect food labelling as of the 1st of January. And uh, I look forward to any questions. Thank you very much indeed, Julie. Uh, and we now turn to Lee Taylor, who's going to talk to us about UKCA marks. Lee. Hi uh, everyone, uh, thanks for having me. Uh, my name is uh, Lee Taylor. I'm a trade stands officer and a business support officer in, for your local trading standards service. And uh, this is my presentation on the UKCA Mark Guide, the guide that we produced and, and is available in the Heart of the Southwest, on the Heart of the Southwest Growth Hub transition page. So if you want more detail on this, then uh, go to the guide and uh, you'll find it there, as well as a lot of it other useful, very useful information on um, EU transition and um, as such. Um, okay, so next slide please, Olivia. So UKCA mark from January 1st will be the new mark or declaration that shows products produced and supplied across the Great Britain market comply with relevant safety standards. Okay, next slide please. And uh, here's the mark itself. Uh, the guide itself contains links to the actual mark and um, has details on proper dimensions, sizes, legibility, and so forth. So I'll uh, defer you to the guide to look at those. Um, next slide, please. And uh, here are the products that it applies to, major products, uh, toys, uh, EMC, compatible EMC products, um, and uh, if we can look at the next slide as well, please. And here's the rest of them, PPE, uh, low voltage electrical equipment, so basically any electrical equipment and various others, okay. Uh, if we can look at the next slide, we have four specific special product areas which differ from the information that I'm going to provide today. So if you operate in these particular four areas, just be aware in only in these particular four areas of product, um, the deadlines and the way and the processes for applying the UKCA mark are different to what I'm going to, to the, uh, to what I'm going to talk about today. So uh, the um, actual um, guide does have links specifically to these, uh, to the guide for these special areas. And note that some of them actually have to have mandatorily the UKCA mark on from January 1st. So uh, apologies to anyone who just uh, realized that if you're in that area, but um, uh, I'll refer you to the guide again and those particular areas just for these particular special product areas. Okay, but for the rest that we just looked at, uh, this is what we'll, what I'll speak about today will be what we, what we'll have to cover, what you'll have to deal with. Okay. Uh, next slide, please, Olivia. So really to summarize that anything that currently requires a CE mark at some point will eventually need a UKCA mark to be supplied in Great Britain. And for those who don't know already, by Great Britain, I do mean England, Scotland, and Wales, because of course, Northern Ireland does have those special arrangements. And so this doesn't apply there, slightly different. I'll touch, I can't go in depth on Northern Ireland arrangements because it is too much for today's short presentation, but I will touch on it briefly at the end. Okay, hopefully in a way that you'll it'll be simple enough for you to understand it some, in some level. Okay, uh, next slide please, Olivia. Sorry, I can't see the next slide. Next slide, please. Ah, no. Yes, sorry. Now? Uh, yep, 
okay sorry yep yeah, yeah i've got it so yeah the um so uh the basics of this so after a transition period uh, the important thing to remember is that the c mark it's not going anywhere it's still uh, perfectly you know, usable it's used still be used across europe um what's going to happen though from you know after a period starting from january 1st to after january 1st 2022 it's not going to be recognized in the great britain anymore and similarly if you apply ukca mark to your product that's not going to be recognized in the eu or in northern ireland so essentially what you have to get right is make sure that for your product you've got the correct marking on the correct product in the correct geographical area otherwise it's going to be deemed not compliant and you'll have a whole host of problems okay next slide please now if there is some good news it's this that um as far as the regulations and the standards that you're applying to your product and the safety procedures that you're applying and all the processes you currently go through they're going to say the same for the near future so that means that roughly 80 percent of what you're currently doing is going to remain the same and there are only a marginal amounts of differences that you need to worry about uh, next slide please olivia so and that's broken up of course into two main areas you're either manufacturing and exporting ce marked goods to the EU market or you're producing and currently importing CE marked goods for the Great Britain market. We'll look at those two scenarios now. Okay, next slide please. So if your goods are being produced for the EU market, what you do is you carry on CE marking as before. As I said, the CE mark isn't going anywhere and all those standards still apply in across Europe. As I've just mentioned, a lot of the things will stay the same. Your safety procedures, paperwork, a lot of those things in relation to the safety of the product will remain the same. Where the changes come relates to if you use third party assessors to assess the safety of your product or notified bodies as part of that process. OK, and there's also some slight differences in terms of whether or not you use authorised representatives and what happens when you directly export into the EU. Uh, next slide please so if you're great britain based those third party assessors and or notified bodies if you use them need to be recognized by the eu and that's the key thing so all uh, so essentially they need to go through a process to make sure that they're recognized by the eu to see mark products and um those bodies and assessors should have already been going through the process of getting that done. So if the first conversation, if you've not already done it, and if you're using these third party assessors, notify bodies, is to contact them to say, hey, are you officially recognized by the EU because I'm exporting to the EU? Okay, and then you can go from there. For authorized representatives, they now need to be situated in the EU to export to the EU. So it's whether you already have them or whether you need to organize them if that suits your business. Okay. Now, the next part in terms of directly importing, while it's not a legal requirement specifically for you, you this is a practical um, effect of what's going to happen. Uh, essentially, if you directly import export into the EU, those people you supply could become importers and what that means is they now have extra legal responsibilities for the safety of that product and so as practical terms you may have a number of your suppliers if you directly export into the eu turning around asking you for more information about the product more safety test certificates and more information so that they can satisfy their legal ob obligations so that just may, and it come, may come as quite a shock to some and some may not realize that they have to do this so that's just a practical sort of effect that's going to happen so it may it's worth being prepared for uh, next slide please olivia Oh, I think we've gone. Ah, there we are. Yeah, thanks. Um, now, at this stage, I just wanted to point out a little slight misconception that I hear from a couple of I've heard from a couple of sources. And um, that is uh, with the deal, whenever it arrives, that this will all go away. And this is just a backup. We don't have to do anything, essentially, because, you know, that once a deal sorted, this will this will all go away. And, and just to clear that up. Now, there is a little bit of truth in that there are negotiations ongoing for a mutual recognition agreement. But what that only covers is 
the actual third party assessors and the notified bodies that I just mentioned. So essentially, they'll, they'll look working on an agreement to mutually recognize that UK, UK and GB based third party assessors and notified bodies can assess the safety of CE mark stuff and vice versa for EU based for UKCA mark. So that's, but that's all it covers. Doesn't mean the UKCA mark isn't coming in. Doesn't mean you're not going to need to do the work to get that UKCA mark if you're supplying in the Great Britain market. Okay, so there is definitely change coming, definitely work to be done. Okay, next slide, please. Okay, so now on to what I think most people want to talk about is if your goods are being manufactured or they're coming in for abroad for the Great Britain market. Okay, so similar if you're exporting to the EU. You continue CE marking as before. It's not going to be illegal to put the CE mark on. It just won't be recognised after 2022. Okay. And again, a lot of the things say the same. Procedures, safety assessments, all the same. Okay. Uh, changes I mentioned relating to third party assessors, notified bodies, authorised re representatives. Well, they'll apply vice versa for the companies that are assessing in the EU and then trying to import into the UK and G Great Britain okay and um, as well as that though you'll now have to apply the UKCA mark to your products next slide please Olivia okay and here are the major deadlines for you if that applies so first one January 1st while the legislation states that you're compelled to put the UKCA mark on from January 1st really it's more like you you can begin to because it's, it's sort of a soft deadline really because the hard deadline that you want to be paying attention to is January 1st 2022 because that's when the CE mark is no longer officially recognized in Great Britain okay so that's the hard deadline by which you need to have at least the UK CA mark on in some fashion okay I say in some fashion because an in uh, January 1st 2023 is when the, the deadline for when the UK CA mark needs to be directly affixed to your products to be supplied on the GB market. So up until that point, you can apply it by any means. That's labeling, going with the product, packaging, over stickering, whatever you want. Okay, until as long as it goes with the individual product. One further deadline, which I haven't mentioned here, which is probably um, of importance as well. Um, up until January 1st, 2021, because I know bigger companies will sort of manufacture way in advance, anything manufactured up until and ready to supply up until January 1st, 2021, doesn't, this change doesn't apply to them, so they could still be CE marked, even if they're supplied to a couple of years down the line past 20, January 1st, 2022. So that's just important to point that out. Okay, next slide, please, Olivia. So if you're importing CE Mark goods into Great Britain, like I mentioned about the people becoming importers in EU, the same is going to apply to us. And this will apply to a lot of small businesses, I feel. And there may be some confusion around this and some difficulties for them as a, as a result. So if you're importing CE Mark goods into Great Britain directly, you're now going to be probably like, more than likely be considered an importer. What that means very briefly is that you now have the responsibility for the safety of those products. That means you need to keep more information on the product, technical files, testing. You may need to get your own testing done as well. And on top of that, you need to add the name and address of your, your business to that product. And of course, you'll need to ensure that UKCA mark is applied, whether you apply that yourself or whether you get the manufacturer or importer from the EU or exporter from the EU to put that on for you. Okay. Okay. Next slide, please. Lee, we're just running into timing difficulties. If we can go sure. to a conclusion. I have got just these slide, last Great two man. slides, and that's it. Um, so I said I'd touch on Northern Ireland. Essentially, what I've just provided here in this last slide is just a very nice summary. Uh, it's from the Northern Ireland um, gov.uk guidance, which is also linked in the guide, um, just to give you basic breakdown of what mark you need to put on to go where. And that is includes Northern Ireland, that's EU and that's UK. So I'll just leave that up there for a couple of seconds because I think that's going to be useful as a guide to say, okay, what, where, what do I need to put on to go where? Okay. 
All right, and my last side, please, Olivia. And this is just the link to the guide. That's the link to the heart of the Southwest transition page and our contact details there. Should you require more specific information, you can contact us. Okay, thanks very much for listening. Lee, thank you very much indeed. Uh, important information there from all our speakers. Uh, and just to remind you that the, the information that's been shared today will be circulated or, and is available. Now, we, we're keen to leave time for some questions and some pithy answers. So we've had one or two in the chat box up to now, which have been dealt with in writing. Anything that anyone would like to raise in the five or 10 minutes that remains to us? Uh, don't be shy. You've got three experts in front of you. <clears throat> I'm quite happy to say a few words if um, draw it all together if people do not have questions. It may be that the presentations were so thorough and uh, interesting that they haven't provoked any further questions. Um, then in which case, I'm looking, Jason, will you nod if you think that I can just draw this together? I, I think I'd like to just actually apologize to everyone that there isn't more clarity and certainty over this trade deal. Uh, I, I used to have a proper job before I became a member of parliament. I, I recognize the importance of certainty and clarity for all of you business people. Um, I'd expected by now, just about by now, though I agree with Surin that um, actually these things with the EU almost always happen at the last minute, and maybe it still will, five to midnight, we're not quite there yet. But I'm sorry that it isn't as um, clear as it might be, but we will get there in the end. Um, now, we have got a question, actually, from Richard Hosking. Let's have a look at, Richard, what you've got to say for yourself. Ah, yes, it's a point. A question for me. I, I, I thought that, too, as he went through the UKCA mark. I don't know who designed it, but it does, doesn't look very British. Uh, I'll, I'll, Richard, I'll take that back. Lee, did you want to comment on that? Did, did, did you design it yourself? Uh, I did not design it myself, but it is, um, it's just, very, very similar to the current CE mark, which uh, yeah. one would say is not very uh, European or uh, <laughs> very yeah. sort of uh, waving any sort of European styles uh, uh, on that either. So it really is just a very simple sort of recreation or of our version of the CE mark, which is uh, quite boring as well, actually. <laughs> I will feed Richard's point, excellent point, back into government, see if we can jazz it up a bit over the years ahead. All right, well, thank you all very much indeed for attending. Uh, thanks again to our, our sp three speakers. It was very interesting uh, and uh, just what we needed to hear at this time. It is basically, with all these things, it's all about the detail, isn't it? Getting the detail right. There will be something uh, in place, I'm very confident over the next few weeks, which will help everyone to um, trade and deal and relate to Europe in a very positive way. Thank you to our three speakers then. And thanks once again to Southwest Tourism Alliance, Federation of Small Businesses, Institute of Directors, Visit Devon, Plymouth, uh, Devon, and, uh, sorry, Stuart, I always want to say Plymouth and Devon Chamber of Commerce. I, I know it's Devon and Plymouth Chamber of Commerce. I'm so sorry about that. Uh, and the NFU, thank you for all your support. Thanks for attending. Hope you have a very positive today. Go out there and make an awful lot of money and see you again very, very soon. Thank you.